Dziękuję. of your sins. Give your prayer to your servant maid, servant Teresa, for whom today you perform the fraternal office of burial. A share with your chosen ones in the blessedness you gave. So that in the day of resurrection, freed from the bond of immortality, she may come before your face. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. 
Angel is free, fast, and secure. You can send money to Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa. Send more than money with Pay Angel money transfer. Send that love, send that smile, show you care. Download the Pay Angel app now.
certificate in advanced nursing administration from the Royal College of Nursing in 1980. Before continuing her studies in Oxford, she attended the Republic Day dance in London with a friend in 1961. Unknown to her, a young man who had recently been called to the bar at Lincoln's Inn was also going to the dance. Coincidentally, he was planning to move to Ox Exeter College in Oxford to further his studies and had been advised by a friend to take a good look at Miss Theresa. John Ejokum Kufo had set his heart on working in public service and wanted to find a Ghanaian woman to support him in that career. He asked for a change of partners on the dance floor and introduced himself to Theresa. They became friends. They later saw each other in Oxford and renewed their acquaintance. The following year, during a trip to Ghana to register for the Ghana Bar, John Kufo told his mother about his friendship with Abba. His mother knew the Mensa family, so she told him to take a bottle of schnapps to Ochesa, the Mensa family home, by way of an introduction. John was accompanied by his relative, Nana Dakut Kufo. At Ochesu, they saw Mami and her senior brother, Master Boyne, who recognized John from his time at Government Boys School. J.H. Mensah Sr. was cordial and accepted the bottle of schnapps, but unfortunately, he died within a couple of weeks. The heartbroken Theresa could not attend their father's funeral. However, John Ejekum Kufo and his family were present. The couple decided to get engaged and were married at the Brompton Oratory in Knightsbridge, London, on the 8th of September, 1962. Theresa was sad that her father would not be walking her down the aisle. However, her brother, J.H., was in London on his way to a conference so he assumed that role. The newlyweds began their married life in Oxford, and after they had completed their studies, they moved to Muswell Hill in London. The couple had three children within three years. The first, John Adokabo, also known as Chief, was followed by Anne Marie Nanama Ampuma a year later, and Helen Nanasa the year after that. By 1965, the family had returned to Ghana and set up home in Kumasi. And Theresa began working at Tech Hospital on the campus of the University of Science and Technology. She had many friends and worked alongside her best for friends, Mrs. Justina Osebonsu. In 1968, 
the couple had a fourth child, a son, named Edward Kojojokum. When the Progress Party won the general election of 1969, and Theresa Kofor's husband became a member of parliament, the family moved to Accra. He was appointed a deputy minister of foreign affairs, so he traveled frequently on government business. Theresa focused on supporting him, hosting dignitaries, and raising her children. Her best friend Justine and set about rebuilding her life with her four young children. Her brother J.H. was also in political detention at Insawem prison. She drew strength from her Catholic faith as she fasted and prayed. Her strength of character and determination to do things her way helped during this period. Family and friends rallied around with her elder sister's husband, Mr. Frimpon, aka Bench, and her mother, Mami, being among the frequent visitors to the small house in Kanda. In June 1972, Theresa had her last child, a boy, named Victor Kofi Ousue Friye Mensa. She befriended some of the wardens at Asha Fort, and they would sometimes come home for a meal and to collect her husband's laundry before their shift. Children were not allowed visits to the prison, a policy with which she disagreed. On Christmas Day, she took her children to Asha Fort, muttering about them not being allowed to see their father. She told the older ones to stand outside by the small metal gate with bars in the wall which linked the cells to the waiting area. And she went inside with the baby wrapped in a cloth. Her determination paid off. Mr. Kofor saw the baby during that visit and waved to the other children as he walked with the guard to and from the visiting area. Mrs. Kofor was strict, but a loving mother. She taught her children to work hard, attend mass regularly, and always have faith in God. Their lives revolved around Christ the King Church and its school, which all the children attended. They were also registered as members of the Catholic Youth Organization and the Boy Scouts or the Girl Guides. She seemed to know everything that happened in her house, and anyone caught breaking a rule would be dealt with. She was a good storyteller who had a way with words, and the house was always filled with laughter. She could whistle every family member's name clearly, including her husband's. She was sociable and caring, and had a group of loyal friends. She was also a mother to all manner of people, and the house was often full. Her husband was released from prison after 15 months and they set about rebuilding their lives. In the middle of 1973, she began work as the first matron of the newly established Coco Clinic. The Third Republic was inaugurated in 1979, and Theresa's husband re-entered Parliament as the deputy minority leader. Family life was busy, and with the children engaged in extracurricular activities, while Theresa continued to work full-time and support her husband. After flight left Nanjari, John Rollins seized power in a coup in 1981. However, life became difficult. The couple decided to send the older children to London for safety. In 1982, the eldest two left, and they were followed a year later by the third. Mrs. Kofor, was now supporting her family on two continents. She left Coco Clinic and ventured into self-employment. In 1992, it was decided that Ghana would return to diplomatic, democratic rule, and Theresa threw herself into supporting her husband in all his campaigning. She extended her network, attended rallies, and used her local language skills to good effect. She spoke Ghana fluently too. 
she was at her husband's side when he won the nomination to lead the new patriotic party in the 1996 presidential election and was there when he considered defeat to President Rawlings. He ran again in 2000 and she became the first lady when John Kofor was sworn in as president on January 7th, 2001. Theresa shunned the limelight, but graciously accepted the responsibility of being a mother to the nation. As she was a nurse, she decided to focus on issues that had a bearing on women's and children's lives, the need to provide advice and vocational training opportunities for young women. Community-run creches, preschool facilities and micro-enterprises that would lead to long-term self-sufficiency. She attended Mass at Christ the King regularly despite her busy schedule and was often to be seen singing with the choir, which she joined in 1995. Mrs. Kufour set up a non-governmental organization, the Mother and Child Community Development Foundation, to assist women and children living in deprived areas. Her achievements include the establishment of development centers in underdeveloped areas of Accra, such as Kotobabi and Amasamai. She facilitated the acquisition and installation of a mammogram machine at Sunyani General Hospital and sponsored training in soap making, dress making, shea butter processing in such areas as Kumasi, Kofodia, and the then three Norgin regions. The foundation also built and equipped a bakery and in Sawim. She spoke tirelessly about the need to curb the spread of HIV AIDS in Africa by setting targets for prevention, treatment, care, and support. She traveled extensively, locally and internationally with and without her husband. Theresa was a good ambassador for Ghana. She worked behind the scenes to influence government policy in areas such as free school feeding, free medical care for pregnant women, and free compulsory and universal basic education. After her husband left office in January 2009, Theresa continued her advocacy and support work through her foundation. She also spent more time with her children, grandchildren, extended family and friends. She visited her siblings, brother J.H., brother Peter, and sister Ma often. She attended mass even when she was unwell because she did not want her brother to miss seeing her at church and worry. She was proud when in 2010, the Vatican bestowed on her the papal award of Dame of the Order of St. Gregory the Great. Theresa retired from public life due to ill health. She bore her illness bravely and with quiet dignity. She caught a cold at the end of August 2023 and was admitted to hospital. She rallied and was discharged after a few days, but remained frail. She slipped away gracefully and peacefully at her family house in Pediasi in the afternoon of 1st October 2023, with her family gathered around her. She survived by her husband of 61 years, John Ejekum Kufo, one sister, all five of her children, and 14 grandchildren. May she rest peacefully in the bosom of our Lord. Amen. By the husband, His Excellency, former President of Ghana, John Ajikum Kufu. A tribute by His Excellency, John Ajikum Kufu, to his beloved wife, Abba. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. Proverbs 31, verse 10 and 11. 
shortly after what I now perceive as a clearly foreordained introduction by our mutual friend, Dr. Kwame Apiapogu. Abba and I met in person on 1st July 1961 at a ball at Battersea Town Hall in London to celebrate Ghana's first anniversary as a republic. Abba had just completed nursing school in Edinburgh and was on her way to pursue midway free, a midway free course at the Radcliffe Infirmary, part of Oxford University. I was also on my way to Exeter College, Oxford, having just passed my bar exams at Lincoln's Inn in London. My first impressions of my beautiful Abba were that of a soft-spoken and well-mannered lady. And within a year of bonding and courting, we both discovered that we very much enjoyed each other's company. We had the same cultural tastes in art, music, and cinema, and shared similar social preferences. Consequently, we decided to tie the knot. And this we did at Brompton Oratory in Knightsbridge, London, on 8th September 1962. We were joined by Chief, our first male child, on 6th September 1963. By mid-1964, shortly after completing our studies in Oxford, we moved to London to pursue our respective careers. Our second child and first daughter, Nanama, was born in Golders Green in London on 29th November 1964. However, due to overwhelming pressure from my family in Kumasi, we decided to return home to Ghana. Shortly after our return to Kumasi in January 1965, I joined Okonfo Anochi Chambers as a junior lawyer with Victor Owusu as senior partner. Abba later joined the Kwame Nkrumah University Hospital as a nurse slash midwife. Soon after that, on November 4th, 1965, Abba and I welcomed our third child, Sa, into our rapidly growing family. Our fourth child, Ajikun, was born on 16th February, 1968. By the time he arrived, I was already embroiled in the web of public service. I had been appointed in 1967 as the chief legal officer and city manager of the second city of Ghana, Kumasi. That was our entry into civic and public life in Ghana. Abba had a personality that fitted in with ease everywhere she, we went and which also allowed her to cope under the most challenging of pressures. In 1969, I got elected as a member of parliament of the Second Republic for Achuma and Wabiaja in the Ashanti region. I then also got appointed as Ghana's Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs under the premiership of the late Professor Kofi Abrifa Buzia. So, our young family had to relocate from Kumasi to Accra. Abba, to my delight, took our evolving life in her stride as she adjusted effortlessly and with confidence to our new milieu of a life in national politics and diplomacy. Between 1969 and 1971, with both Abba and me in our early 30s, our lives seemed to be on an upward trajectory, but this was to be truncated with a shocking and unexpected coup d'etat on 13 January 1972, which arrested practically all the members of the government and threw us in prison. Our world was shut, crushed. 54 of us, including Cabinet ministers, junior ministers, and some members of parliament would remain in jail for a minimum period of between 12 and 15 months each. 
having initially endured incommunicado for almost eight weeks, denial of any contact with family or the outside world at Ashaford Prison. This angel of a woman, to my amazement, would survive the ordeal of raising five children on her own. In my absence, Abba gave birth to our fifth and last child, Kofi. As a single parent on 16 June 1972, her strong and exceptionally disciplined personality did indeed come to the rescue of our family. I could not have foreseen the crush that befell us and could not therefore have made any provision for our ordeal. However, Abba rose above that. With her strong prayerful faith in God, Abba's spirit would not and could not be broken. She survived on very little then and she truly kept our hopes alive. When allowed to visit me in prison, she left me with a sense of optimism that was most assuring. I survived my incarceration of 15 months largely because of Abba. She was a woman of sacrifice, devotion, humanity, and resilience. After my release from detention, she returned to practicing nursing at Coco Clinic where she rose to the position of the clinic's first ever matron. Only once did Abba strongly protest about my absence from home, as my entrepreneurial businesses kept me away for extended periods of time. Her commitment to our marriage and her exceptional will to be a loving wife, a caring homemaker, and a firm but loving parent produced the fruit of what our children have become today. She was firm, yet tender. When I was elected to office as the second president of the Fourth Republic of Ghana, Abba would play a pivotal but quiet role in shaping key social interventions, such as including the kindergarten stage for all the children of Ghana in the free compulsory universal basic education policy. The provision of one hot meal a day to primary school children across the nation, the launch of the National Health Insurance Scheme, and the introduction of free maternal care for all. She also worked tirelessly as the founder of, of the Mother and Child Community Development Foundation to support early childhood development programs across the country. Her foundation built three schools and gifted them to communities in Nignano, in the central region, and in Kotobabi and Amasamain in Accra. Through her foundation, she also provided a breast cancer screening unit to a health care services provider in Sunyani, and assisted bakers in Insawam and Adiojui with baking equipment. She established a phone-in counseling center to support and combat the stigmatization of HIV AIDS patients. Remarkably, ABBA rendered all her community action-based services without seeking any publicity. ABBA and I shared a gleeful sense of humor, which meant we could laugh at each other, just as we could naturally forgive each other for our unfailing human shortcomings. She and I embarked on many trips together as I pursued my political career and after I became president. However, what touched her most during our international trips was the recognition she received from Pope Benedict XVI, who bestowed on her the prestigious papal award of Dame of St. Gregory the Great. Throughout her life, she remained a devout Catholic a passionate worshipper and a chorister of Christ the King Catholic Church in Accra. Abba, your departure has left an unbridgeable void in my life, but I take solace from the many mercies and blessings the good Lord has showered on our journey of 62 years, living long, the blessing of beautiful children, 14 splendid grandchildren, 
the honor of having served our nation together, the gift of loving, extended families, and a network of friends around the world. I am so thankful to the good Lord God for giving you to me as my life partner. Abba, you have earned your good rest, and as the words of the Apostle Paul go, you have fought the good fight. You have finished the race. You have kept the faith. Now there is in store for you the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to you on that day, and not only to you, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Fare thee well, Abba. Adieu, my dearest love. Thank you for the beautiful tribute by the former president of Ghana, John Ejikum Kufu. We now invite the children to give us the tribute to Mama Theresa. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18 says, In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ for your life this scripture is not negotiable nor is it conditional so we are compelled by our faith in and belief in Jesus the Christ to yield and to align ourselves accordingly therefore in this instance too, difficult as it may be to reconcile, we give unreserved thanks to God Almighty, for he alone is indeed worthy of all the praise and glory. For the gift of your life to us as our mother, we are thankful. For the gift of your unconditional love for us, we are thankful for the gift of having you to seed, teach, guide, and nurture our faith. We are thankful for the gift of having you as our confidant and cheerleader. We are thankful. Our mother lived the Christian virtues of humility, charity, and fortitude. She had a deep faith in God, which she allowed to remain which allowed her to remain hopeful even in dire situations. She was prayerful and good at listening, which meant that amid the noise of politics, she was in touch with herself and could decipher her quiet inner voice. Our mother was a true Christian, very strong in her faith, and had an admirable personal relationship with God. She prayed about everything, even as she drove to school. We all prayed. Whatever difficulties you've, you had, her advice was first, and her guidance started with and ended with prayer. To wit, have you asked God? Bisanyami, ask God. And God doesn't make mistakes. So soldier on and bear your cross, trusting in Him. When you'd had a little time to wallow in your self pity, she would say, Oh, come off it, child. Get on with it. You would always say, Mama, go before the Lord on your knees with every problem you encounter. Because he is the only one who can deliver you in times of adversity. Always remember to give him thanks. It's not okay when everything is fine with you alone, while your brother or sister is struggling with a problem 
always look after one another whatever you put your hands to do it well to the best of your ability and do it completely have a plan and focus don't compare yourself to others always be yourself and be content with what you have it's not enough to just know right from wrong you must endeavor always to do what you know is right Ma was the perfect blend of calm and emotional balance the mother we knew as, a ch as children was a very loving but very strict woman always although she was encouraging and supported all of us in our endeavors she laid down strict boundaries and rules and there was no escaping her discipline and her moral code mom was warm and gentle loving calm and controlled poised very punctual kind and compassionate she was very hard working and a disciplinarian to the core right from our childhood mom was tough on personal hygiene hey mom fa won kan kan mpo ya ta na she was strict on politeness manners and being considerate by cleaning up after yourself you knelt down and prayed often ma you fasted also you were strict and had rules which were hard to follow sometimes one of the earliest rules was that we couldn't claim ownership of things that we found in the house compound because it was your house everything including the mangoes on the tree belonged to you if you were we had to ask permission the disciplinarian in you and you many coded nicknames such as severe the law chief justice and a few more but somehow you always knew it was you we were referring to she was beautiful stylish graceful but never given to excesses in her appearance her hair which she which was plentiful was all close to natural as possible and more often than not she had it in a favorite simple pompidou hairstyle she wore barely any makeup we wish we could have spent more time with you but i thank god we all thank god for the time we had thank you for loving us all despite our quirkinesses you were the heartbeat of the family and we would always gather around your bed reminiscing and laughing about the events in our childhood including the punishments we recently saw a plaque with the inscription and i quote to the world she was a mother, but to her family she was the world You are our world, mommy. We love you and we miss you. But we'll be fine because God will never give us a burden we cannot carry, as you always said. Rest in perfect peace until we will meet again. Nancy ye. Nancy ye. Nya men fa wo kren se. Ye be she bi. You were giddy. You were giddy past you, Bishop. You never found crazy, Mama. Rest on. I humbly now invite the parish priest of Christ the King Catholic Church, Reverend Father Ebenezer Kese, and his assistant, Reverend Father Donatus Palu, to make a presentation to the children.
the offer tree has been presented to the children who have in turn offered it to the church for the completion of its projects. May the Lord bless all the children for their generosity. A sport of music by the Ghana Police Band. And while they are that, members of the press, I ask that you relocate and position facing the presidential days. Preceding the tribute from the state is a poetry recital to be done by Ousua Apea Davida, affectionately known to us as Nana Mame from Ejira. She's the winner of the kids' traditional contest dubbed Oyrepat Dachi Hima. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Ousua Apea Davida. Government of Ghana tribute to the late Mrs. Teresa Kufo. Teresa Kufo, whose maiden name was Teresa Mensa, was born on 25th October 1935 to Mr. and Mrs. in the Bronx. Businessman. The late Mrs. Kufa is known, among other things, for her experience and in her journey to the of nursing. She started her education at the Catholic convent, Our, Mother, Our Lady of Assumption, the Keta in the Volta region, which enabled her to in Edinburgh. She later studied in Edinburgh, Scotland, registered a general nurse in the Southern Hospital scene. As a go-getter and someone full of passion, Cisco for a hospital in London, certified midwife, premature. The late Mrs. Kufo profession and at a point became the administrator in London. She who subsequently became the love of her life, John Ajekum Kufo in Oxford with both
with five children. The first three in the first three years of marriage. An individual characterized by optimism and positivity. Mrs. Kufua and supported her husband in his political career. Presidency. She became the first lady when her husband became the second president of the Fourth Republic from 2000 to 6 January 2009. Oh, to the head. Personal level through her humility, motherliness, and hospitality. She played an instrumental role during the administration of her husband. A noteworthy impact she made during her tenure as the First Lady was her advocacy for the implementation of UNESCO's free, compulsory, universal basic education program for kindergarten children in the year 2007 through government's white paper on the educational reforms. The objective of the policy was that all Ghanaian children at the age of four should receive two years of early childhood development, ECD, before entering primary one. In line with her support for underprivileged children and mothers, inspired by her compassion, involved in philanthropic endeavors, her direct involvement and commitment to the welfare of poor children and mothers were also evident in the establishment of the Mother and Child Community Development Foundation. MCCDF in June 2001. The foundation is a non-governmental organization that operated both in Ghana and Canada, focusing on the prevention of mother-to-child disease transmission. Mrs. Kufour's remarkable impact in health, education, and women empowerment caught the eyes of both and international organizations. In 2007, she was awarded the Papal Award Pope the 16th for her flinching commitment to the welfare of underprivileged children and their mothers. She also received several awards and citations from various institutions and organizations, including the Ghana Registered Nurses, Ghana Registered Midwives Association, the Ghana AIDS Commission, the Ghana Journalists Association, and the Ghana Women's Excellence Award. Though the demise of our former First Lady has caused us pain. Yet we are grateful to God that her life was impactful. Let us take solace in the beautiful memories we shared with her and be encouraged by her legacy as we do God and country. Rest well, Mrs. Kufour. You will forever be in our hearts. Thank you, Your Excellency, the First Lady. Members of the press, I ask that you retreat 50 meters back. We will.